Um, I'm Todd Wickersham, and the last panel of the day is focused on action. Um, what, you know, you've heard a lot of things about science and about experiences of farmers, of um, what is, is cooling the planet in small ecosystems, what's cooling the planet in larger ecosystems, what's heating the planet in ways of prevention. Um, now is the opportunity to point out some of the things that you can do when you leave today, and you can do in your community and individually. Um, I personally am a big proponent of people doing what they are passionate about. And we've put together sort of a take action list um, in your packet. Some of it's from some of the panelists contribute to this take action list. It's a partial list. If you have additional actions that you recommend that we also include in this take action list, you can email us those, um, and we will add them to, to the list. But um, before, um, I'm not going to talk about anything else now, but I'm going to introduce our panelists. And actually, I'm going to ask them to take five minutes to introduce themselves and some other key things. It's going to start with the backyard, the, yard, uh, the lawns, um, and it's going to go to um, policy and actions that can be done in counties and cities to state some state experiences and then some uh, federal experiences. And this panel has experiences on all of those levels, um, but that's sort of how it's set up. So I'm going to ask Paul to start and introduce himself. And his slide should be here. You're going to have to use that, Mike. OK. Let's see if the slides are here. So while the slides are hopefully popping up, I always begin my talks all over the world with the same question. Have you ever been to Bradford, Maine? Well, I was speaking in Hawaii about 10 years ago with a lei around my neck. It was the only time I ever spoke with a lei around my neck and a flowery print shirt and shorts on. And someone actually raised their hand. Uh, 6,000 miles from the northeast corner of Maine, someone claimed to have been there. And I said, you must have been lost. So why Bradford, Maine? Well, that's where I grew up although the growing up part is still a work in progress, in the 1960s. And this was my grandmother's favorite time of year. My grandmother grew all of the food for the farmhands and the friends and the family on a garden that was maybe twice the size of this room. We went to the big city of Bangor once every couple of months, four or five times a year at the most, for the few things that we couldn't be self-sufficient on at the farm. Her favorite time of year was now when the dandelions started popping up on the lawn because by then the canning cupboard, which I still have in my home in Potomac, Maryland, that canning cupboard was threadbare and we were really tired of eating canned string beans anyway. So she would go door to door to door on Reeves Road in Bradford, Maine and dig them up and she'd come back with a big mess of green, she called it, and she would force feed them to me, that bitter taste that we heard about earlier, and she'd say, they're good for what ails you. Well, the question is, how did we get from the 1960s, where you have women espousing the virtues of dandelions, probably one of the top five most nutritious foods on the planet, to now we have a multi-billion dollar industry set up to kill all of those dandelions? So the second question in my brief remarks here is, has anybody been to that place you see on the screen up there? I think a few of you have come to see me so far. It's known as Glenstone. So it's about 20 minutes northwest of here. Uh, depending on the day, a half an hour or two hours, depending on the traffic. So uh, don't try to come out at Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. But we are open to the public Thursday through Sunday. It's a modern art museum on the face of it, but behind the scenes, more and more, it's a 220-acre living classroom. I came to Glenstone seven years ago for what I thought would be a one-day consulting gig to show them how to do organic landscaping. And the founders were having starting a family and they didn't want they were reading the material safety data sheets on the back of the weed and feed products and the roundup and all of that stuff that they were putting on. And the mom, Mrs. Rails, said, I don't want my children crawling through this stuff. So I went there for what I thought was going to be one day. It became one day a month, became a few days a month, a few days a week, and now I literally live right there. We went all organic on June the 23rd of 2010. You can see our organic lawn in the foreground right here. It is the greenest lawn in the neighborhood. Going organic is not going ugly. Now, is Martha still here, Martha Holdridge? OK, well, the next slide is in honor of Martha. She invited me to speak. If we can, if we can go to the, I don't have the, do I, is this clicker going to work? OK, there we go. So Martha invited me to speak at the French Embassy last year. Excuse me. Coming out of the Paris 
protocols, they were looking for ways to cut carbon. The single biggest opportunity that we have in the country, folks, the single biggest opportunity is to change the way we care for lawns. Lawns is bigger than corn, soybeans combined. It's 50 million acres of poisons being spread all over the country. It's a really bad deal. And where our children are crawling through it, our children are rolling around on this stuff. So back at Glenstone, 220 acres, no pesticides for the last seven years. And we've done the calculations. If everybody switched from chemical intensive lawn care with all of that watering, all of that mowing, we could combat the carbon problem in this lifetime. It's the single simplest solution that I've heard anybody come up with. Because we're not going to change big ag. But I do think that we can change people's backyards behavior. So are lawns good or bad? You'll hear the industry tell you that lawns are really good. And grow as many lawns as you can and water and put down all that fertilizer. Well, the fact is lawns are great carbon sinks. And they do sequester carbon. But when you have to mow it so often and fertilize it and put all those pesticides down and empty water tables and collect all your grass clippings and put them by the side of the road, all of those things added up make lawns a really terrible idea. So at Glenstone, we don't bag the clippings. You know, there's lots of things that we don't do. I hope you'll come out to Glenstone and see us. And focus on public policies. So Montgomery County in Maryland has banned, you might have heard, but there's a, it's against the law to put pesticides down on public and private property. It's the most ambitious law in America. There's a few communities around the country that are doing this, but the entire county of Montgomery County, Maryland has now done this. And of course, they're being sued by the chemical pesticide industry, saying it's, that's a bad idea. What people are afraid of is losing money. That's what they're afraid of. But we know how to do it, so it looks really good. If people tell you that organic lawn care doesn't work, and organic lawn care is no different than organic agriculture. It's really focused on compost. Add compost. If you just do that one simple thing, you can really change your lawn. So we, and anything to do with organic fertilizer, organic fertilizer is another word for organic waste. So leaves that fall on the ground, if we don't rake them up and put them in a plastic bag, that's, orga that's organic fertilizer. Grass clippings are organic fertilizer. This fish waste is organic fertilizer. All of this stuff used to be, it's just free fertilizer. It used to be either a plant or an animal. And we're just reusing it again and cutting down the carbon problem. So those are my comments. I do have a book for sale called The Organic Lawn Care Manual out back. And anybody wants to talk about action, did anybody in the room know that it's against the law to put Roundup or weed and feed down on lawns in Canada? Anybody know that? It's, that's the truth. It has been for years. It all started in one community called Hudson, Quebec, with one doctor who dared to speak out. The case went all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court because this little town of Hudson, Quebec, banned weed and feed and Roundup. And of course, the chemical industry sued them. It went through the Canadian court system for 10 years, and the little town won nine to nothing. And because of that, you can't walk into Home Depot in Canada and, and buy Roundup. They don't even sell it. And it all, it's all, it, this, we told the story in this documentary called The Chemical Reaction. I have a few copies with me, but you can look it up. So it's, it's a great story. So thanks. Do I get the pass for Yep. OK. I'll let so, so, so next up we have Ling. And um, she is going to introduce herself and more about what she's doing. But I also want to say Paul's book is Organic uh, Lawn Care Manual. And it is in the back. Um, and he'll be around for a little while to sign it if you'd like a signed copy. So. Great. Thank you. Well, I have to give it to all of you people for staying the whole you know, uh, conference. So uh, kudos to all of you. Um, uh, I just wanted to throw out a statistics. Um, synthetic pesticides used on lawns annually is 30,000 tons. And the amount of pesticides that reach the target organism is about 0.1%, while the remaining bulk contaminates our soil. So what we have is suburban lawns on a pesticide fertilizer cycle because uh, the cycle harms the soil life. Weeds come up, they put more, so more fertilizer and pesticides on it, and the cycle continues and is the treadmill. Um, so in Montgomery County, I got started from a push from my daughter. Um, she was four at the time, and uh, she had asthma, 
and um, and we our neighborhood continually sprayed uh, pesticides every season multiple times and so did our neighbors and so uh, I was remembering when she was four I was telling her explaining to her why we couldn't go out to play why she couldn't go out to play and I was frustrated and I said maybe I wish I would someone would do something about it maybe when you grow up you can <laughs> so she looked at me and thought for a second why can't you <laughs> so <laughs> yep so you know our kids don't want our problems they want us to clean up our own messes um, so that's where my journey started um, so uh, I had no good answer for her so in that span of time eight years we worked on changing our community I got um, I got myself educated. I met like-minded people at very, at the very like conferences like this, um, and you know, in that span of time, Safe Girl Montgomery has um, advocated and sought the passage of pesticide-free legislation first in Tacoma Park, Maryland, a very progressive community, and then we took it to the bigger Montgomery County uh, com community neighborhood. Um, so, and it's, it's a big deal because Montgomery County is one of the most populous county in Maryland. And, um, and, uh, and it's not just a rich county, but we have people of all income levels. Um, so, and we, we believe that people can go organic uh, without pesticides. So the, the law says, uh, as Paul Tukey explained, um, basically uh, it stops people from applying pesticides which includes fertilizers, um, herbicide, I'm sorry, includes insecticides, um, uh, herbicides, and fungicides, and other uh, uh, synthetic pesticides. Um, so, so one of the things that I wanted to give you the power to do what we did, because I'm not an activist, you know, my little kid pushed me along, but everybody can do this. Um, we met with our with our decision makers, and in the local com jurisdictions, it's much easier to convince a handful of lawmakers or less than a dozen lawmakers than it is sometimes to to convince a whole state legislature. Um, so, and also at the local level, you can fi see much quicker um, uh, you can see much quicker change. A policy and and how it affects people uh, much easier than at the state level or federal level. Um, one of the really most powerful things that we use is petitions. You'll often hear lawmakers say, "Oh, those don't matter. They're just people signing on." But you know what? They do matter because that's how we were able to pass our law. We bombarded them with with residents who wanted this change. And they got emails, they got letters, they got, you know, we constantly send them updates on our petitions, and they're like, oh, please stop, we'll do something. <laughs> you know, so, um, so they did research, and they had multiple, uh, the lawmakers had multiple hearings on it, um, but we kept the issue in the forefront of them. We went to uh, community meetings, community uh, meetings to bring the issue to them, to the community. Um, and we went to events to bring the issue to, to, to the community again. And so just keeping the issue alive and, and speaking on it whenever you can. Um, the other really great thing that we did was we developed uh, partnerships. We reached out to other organizations. We were a group of five people, but we were able to reach out to, you know, 15,000 people through other organizations reaching out to their members. So um, that's, it's very powerful to engage uh, partners. Um, lastly, I just want to say be persistent. You know, keep trying. Uh, most bills don't pass with the first attempt, you know, or policies change with the first attempt, but you learn and you improve. Um, and one of the things that, one of the stories I want to share is that when I was telling my friend that I was coming here today, um, she told me, make it easy. People don't want to do anything unless it's easy. I told her, that's not the group of people I'm talking to today. <laughs> They're not sitting through a oh. <laughs> oh, I said, they're not sitting through. 
through a whole day conference just to, for us to give them easy solutions. You know, so be creative and you know, be persistent. And also, I also want to share one more thing. So when everyone can do something, and um, through Sierra Club Maryland, we're going to be doing free yard signs for people to, to you know, help raise awareness in their community. So we have signs like this, pesticide free yards, and also um, be safe, sorry. Uh, be safe yards, we don't use lawn and garden pesticides. So that's a way that you can reach out to your neighbors or your community and help other people jump on the issue. Thank you. Hi, I'm Betsy Nicholas. I'm executive director of Waterkeepers Chesapeake and the founder of the Fair Farms campaign. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the full spectrum of how to get involved and how to be active in all of these things. So a lot of it started with things like yesterday. So who was marching? Yay! Good job, everyone. So if you feel the need to like shake around, wiggle, get that lactic acid moving through your body, go ahead, because I'm there with you. I was marching for hours, hours and hours and uh, carrying a banner and everything else. So my, my body's a little stiff. Um, but that's obviously one of the good ways, you know, and hugely important to make our voices heard and show that we're... You have been conducting a meeting for uh, a long period There we go. Of time. Siri doesn't like me. Oh, is that it? Oh, okay. I can hold it in place. Okay, so um, getting involved at that level, having your voice be heard, and joining with other communities is really, really important. I'm sure that, you know, for everyone who was out there, we saw from indigenous tribes to food and justice groups to, of course, our giant blue presence of the water keepers and the water groups out there. Um, it was just really inspiring and showed how big and important this movement is. So today we've really been focusing on the farming and the agriculture sector and what you can do from there. And so there's everything from your personal choices and what you do as a consumer, because everybody is a consumer in the agricultural world. So just from the choices you make, not buying GMO corn, not, not putting pesticides on your lawn, all of these things, you can have direct personal impacts with your choices, with your activities, with what you're doing. But the other thing is think about getting involved with efforts like the local ordinances. Um, what, what Montgomery County did is amazing. Think about bringing that to other cities and other states. And that pesticide, that important pest, it's really cranky. That important pesticide reduction could be really amazing. I'm holding it. I'm going to give you this one. Okay. Just hold it. Should I click on me? <laughs> okay. All right. So, is it me? Is it really me? Okay. There we go. Um, <laughs> it doesn't like me. Um, so. Maybe that'll make it work. At any rate, um, the other big, it, it is me. It doesn't like me. Oh, is it the receiver? OK. Um, yeah. So the other big part of activism is working at your, OK, at, at the um, elected office level and getting involved in state politics. So that's an area we've also been really involved. And for that, we also rely on all of you. Those of you who've been involved in working for your organizations, we have you know, farmers and farming partners in the room, different climate groups and activists, people who are just interested in these issues. And from all of those different perspectives, you can play a really active role in developing new policy, legislation, regulations, that can all play an important role in what happens next. 
and we had a great result with that this legislative session in Maryland and we worked together a really diverse group of partners to develop new legislation on healthy soils and this was super exciting for all of us. It came up really quickly and um, we were able to take what was really poorly written and would not have accomplished our goals to changing that, getting really good information in there, and making a brand new law in Maryland to establish a healthy soils program that requires biological activity in the soil to be protected and carbon sequestration. So that program exists in Maryland now. And we have a diverse, yeah, woohoo! <laughs> Um, and we have a really diverse group of people who are working on it to make sure that the next steps, now that we have the program, continue. Um, and that means, you know, getting funding, right? Because having a great program, if it doesn't have any money, is not going to get us very far. But getting that next step in there, getting that funding, getting education out there to farmers of how they can participate in these programs, what that skill set is that they can acquire, how they can move from practices that may not be as beneficial to these new practices. And so at every step in that process, you know, we're going to have an opportunity to change what's happening on the ground and use this as something that's beneficial at every single level. It's good for farmers, it's good for the water, it's good for the land, and it's good for the climate. So this is going to be a win-win in every, every scenario here, including for the Chesapeake Bay and meeting the TMDL and pollution limits for the bay. Um, but especially we have to you know, be conscious of this issue of farmers and where do they fare in all of this. And this is something that would be really good for them. Um, so we have to you know, keep working on it and make sure to get that funding aspect in there. On the other side of something we worked on was uh, a study for atrazine, which unfortunately we didn't um, succeed on, but that's something that we'll push forward again in the next legislative session and again be looking to all of you and relying on all of you for your help and involvement in every way from writing letters to testifying to meeting with your elected officials. All of those ways of getting involved in this process help support these changes or even just if you don't want to do any of those things, you can donate money to organizations who do all of those things. And it's a way to keep this process moving and get these policies in place. And if you're not very familiar with atrazine, it, it, like glyphosate, it's the other big nasty thing that's used on corn um, with a very sketchy um, <laughs> history and uh, is a likely carcinogen. So, um, so lots and lots of ways to get involved. And so try them out and try using all of them. Fantastic. Thank you. Maybe like other people better. Um, Alexis is going to finish us up, and then we're going to have a round of questions. We'll probably have about 10 minutes for questions um, afterwards. So. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexis Baden-Mare. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. And in 2015, we also started an international coalition, Regeneration International. Um, so we are actively promoting carbon farming. And today I have a very specific request because I know that a lot of you uh, work with environmental organizations. So far today I've met folks from Elders Climate Action, um, folks who had volunteered with the Citizens Climate Lobby, um, folks with 350. Are there other organizations? Sierra Club probably? Yeah. So you all are all involved. You're climate activists. So um, Sierra Club, for instance, already has a fantastic um, statement on agriculture that includes carbon farming. So many environmental organizations have already stepped up and endorsed this. But if your organization has not yet created an endorsement or a resolution in support of carbon farming as a solution to climate change, please do so. And, and then I have a very specific request for you coming out of this conference. You have learned so much today. I'm sure you're ready to share this information with someone, anybody, because it's exciting, positive information. We have a solution here 
that not only addresses the climate crisis, but it also creates healthy, nutritious food. It improves the water cycle. It conserves water and, and makes water available. It's, it's a world you can imagine living in. It isn't the dystopic future that you think of when you think of climate change. It's a, a positive change that we could make because of climate change, but it has so many benefits. So please take this message back to your state legislatures. And I have a specific ask. It's look up the Hawaii Carbon Farming Tax Credit Bill. Hawaii Carbon Farming Tax Credit Bill. I think you all heard me, but the mic cut out. Yes. Uh, Hawaii Carbon Farming Tax Credit Bill in the Hawaii State Legislature. And I did a quick survey of all the legislation that's out there right now on carbon farming, and there are various versions. Uh, Maryland's is very good, it's a great start, but we don't yet have a funding source, and we don't yet have a specific program to benefit farmers who are do engaged in carbon farming. And I think this, this Hawaii bill, that one any better. this Hawaii bill, has an elegant solution to that problem because if you don't have a funding source, you can create a tax credit. And it also has excellent definitions of carbon farming and it has a beautiful prelude that talks about how this is an important solution to the climate crisis. And it also has some restrictions on practices associated with industrial agriculture that you may not use if you want to be a carbon farmer and get this tax credit. So it's a very good piece of model legislation. So please look that up, read it, see what you think. Um, and if you think it's something worth passing on to your state legislators in your state, please do so. And then let's can please get back to me and let me know what's going on in your state. So far I know that Vermont, New York, Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts is going to, Maryland has, California has an active program that's funded under the cap and trade program. So if you put a price on carbon, you can also create a fund of money that can support carbon farming. In California, they also prioritized preserving farmland. Because even if you are using nearly the worst agricultural practices, it's still better to have that as farmland than to have that land developed. And of course, you have a chance then to remediate it and go organic and regenerative. Um, but it's very important to preserve farmland. So that's what they've done in California with their Healthy Soils Initiative. They've created a fund of money through the carbon cap and trade program. And they're putting that money towards regenerative agriculture. So my email address is alexis at organicconsumers.org. And if you're interested in this legislative project, please get in touch with me. I'm hoping to create a working group of people all over the country that are, that are pushing carbon farming legislation. And we can together figure out what's the best strategy, what's the best legislation, and work together. So again, that's alexis, A-L-E-X-I-S, at organicconsumers.org.